All right. So um, welcome to our webinar today, um, Promoting Independent Living in Rural Communities with Jackie Paha from the Brazos Valley Center for Independent Living. Um, we're just going to go through a few quick uh, webinar housekeeping things, and then we will go ahead and get right into the webinar. So um, this is hosted by Texas AgriAbility, and we are funded by the National Institute of Food and Agriculture um, through the USDA. Um, we provide services to individuals with disabilities, chronic health conditions, and functional limitations in agriculture. Um, so just a few webinar instructions. Um, if you would, I believe everyone's microphones are automatically muted. Um, but if you can, um, just mute your microphone to reduce any background noise. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, um, we, we can address questions somewhat as we go, but we will also leave about 10 minutes um, at the end just for questions. But if you have any questions as we go along, if you look at the very top of your screen, um, you will see an option to, uh, looks like a little bubble for the chat. Um, and so you can type your questions in there and we will make sure we get to all of those questions posted there. Um, closed captioning is available. So if you go up to um, the little three dots on the top of your screen, um, you should be able to turn on live captions and see the closed captioning there. Um, the webinar will be recorded for later viewing on our YouTube channel as well. And so the um, we can post a link to that at the end of the webinar, but if you just Google Texas AgriAbility YouTube, um, it should pop up and we will post the recording there as soon as um, we get done. So here's our contact information here with Texas AgriAbility. If you're interested, um, our email address and website, we can also post those in the chat a little later. Um, if you have any questions about our programs or are interested in making Coming a client, you can always reach out to us there and we would love to assist you. So with that, um, I will go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. Um, it is Jackie Paha. She is the founding executive director for the Brazos Valley Center for Independent Living, located near the home of Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. Uh, she has over 30 years of experience working with people who have disabilities as a sign language interpreter, vocational rehabilitation counselor, and special education teacher and administrator. Additionally, she has taught adaptive and assistive technology at Texas A&M and worked with school districts in establishing structured work experience programs for students with disabilities. Jackie has a PhD in educational psychology from Texas A&M. She received her master's degree in counseling and undergraduate degree in rehabilitation services from Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches, Texas. So with that, I will um, get her slides open and turn it over to Jackie. Good morning. I really appreciate y'all letting me um, be part of this today and my my goal is to maybe help you understand Centers for Independent Living and kind of what we do and where we're hidden. Um, we get told frequently that we're the best kept secrets in places so I appreciate the opportunity to be able to um, just talk to you a little bit about what a Center for Independent Living is, how you can find them, and then answer some questions uh, if you have any. You can go ahead and go through the Next slide. So I'll just jump right in. Um, Mackenzie, thank you for that introduction and that overview. And I don't feel like I have 30 years of experience, but that's a good thing, right? To wake up today and not feel that way. Um, tomorrow will be a whole different story. So I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, what a center for independent living is. Most of the time, the word that pops into mind when people read that is, oh, they have beds. They're an assisted living facility. Uh, they're in an aging community. 
That's generally what people think, and that is not the case. Um, if we are community resource centers designed to help people obtain and maintain their independence in their communities and their home environments. So every Center for Independent Living is an independent 501c3 nonprofit charitable organization. And we were founded out of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 as it was amended by WIOA in 2014. So what the heck does all of that mean? In the foundations of looking at the history of Centers for Independent Living, we think about um, a medical model. A lot of times people will, you know, when you look at vocational rehabilitation services or you look at, I've, I have a traumatic event that has happened in my life and now I have to go and um, receive any kind of a serp, receive medical rehabilitation services. Historically, people that have disabilities were, um, had to experience that medical model. And within the Rehabilitation Act, that sort of set forth, you know, okay, what does independent living look like? Well, part of it for us is the self-governance. So it's people with disabilities supporting other people with dis other people with disabilities. Our board of directors have to be comprised of at least 51% people with significant disabilities, as well as our staff. And that is a variety um, cross cross disability. So just about everything you can think of. And just sort of for definitional purposes, um, Title VII, Chapter 1, if you want to go and find it, of the Act states, the current purpose of the program, when I wrote that in there this morning, I thought, uh-oh, current, what does that mean? Um, what are they going to bring down the pike for us? But So the current purpose of the program is to promote a philosophy of independent living including a philosophy of consumer control, peer support, self-help, self-determination, equal access, and individual and systems advocacy in order to maximize the leadership, empowerment, independence, and productivity of individuals with disabilities and the integration and full inclusion of individuals with disabilities in the mainstream of American society. And that is a whole lot of words and there's lots of stuff to unpack from that. And I'm going to try not to overwhelm you with those details, but please feel free to ask questions or reach out afterwards or, you know, go and, and read yourself, whatever, whatever is helpful to you in understanding that. Mackenzie, if you can go to the next slide, please. So one thing about centers, and I may have my slides a little mixed up in how this information is organized, but one thing that you will pro that you will find in every single center for independent living across the country are what what are considered to be core services. Um, so these core services have been part of what a Center for Independent Living has been designated to do through the Rehabilitation Act um, since they were initially included. And that those are the top four. And then that fifth one that's listed there, that transition service, and I'm going to go over each of these four services, but that fifth one was re that fifth one was added when the Rehabilitation Act was reauthorized with WIOA in 2014. So every single Center for Independent Living has to offer these core services. The first one is information and referral. Basically, you know, where can I find, how do I, you know, which, you know, which churches in the area offer sign language interpreting or how do I contact paratransit? anything that's just a really um, quick and ready to give information. That's one of the core services that you'll find at all centers. 
independent living skills training, that can be anything at all that the person who has the disability wants to um, be able to learn. So it can be things like money management and how to ride the public bus system, retirement planning, um, all kinds of, you know, just the whole gamut of what kind of skills, cooking skills, laundry skills during um, the beginning stages of the, of the pandemic that really, you know, brought about the assistive technology training and how to connect with, you know, how do you get into a Zoom and what is Teams about and WebEx, um, all different kinds of things and falls under that independent living skills training. Peer support is a concept of one person with a disability supporting another person with a disability. That might look like um, individual support groups. So for example, at VV Cell, we have a support group for people who have brain injuries. Um, if if a if an, a, a group is available already in the community, our goal is never to duplicate what's already being done. It's to help the person um, get the skills that they need to be able to participate in what's already out there. But at the same time, if that service is not offered or it's not available or not accessible for the person, then as a community-based organization, we're responsible for recognizing what those needs are and, and stepping in to help with that. One of the other aspects of peer support in terms of trying to frame it in what it might look like is if I walked out um, and crossed the street and got hit by a vehicle and I might end up in a rehabilitation facility where I am, you know, medically recovering, I'm being instructed by physical therapist and occupational therapist in, in a medical team and how do I how do I safely transfer from my wheelchair um, on, you know, into the shower or whatever? A peer support model doesn't neglect that professional component of it, but it also brings in, okay, I'm home now and I know what they taught me, but how do I make that work in my own home or in my own work environment or in the, my own setting? So peer support is really integrated with that. We want other people that have disabilities who can say, you know, I understand, I've, I've gone through that, and this is the way that I do it. And that peer support is so invaluable to people. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a depth of understanding that's at the core of what a Center for Independent Living does that is applicable to this is applicable to the population of folks that um, have had some sort of a, a a need for somebody else to be able to relate from them relate to them, but not in a um, fashion where it's I'm I know better. I'm the professional, so I know what to tell you. This is more of a of a peer based setting. So advocacy is also one of the core services that's been there for um, since the, the Rehab Act was initially established to incorporate the Centers for Independent Living. And it has two legs to it. I mean, we also know that there's the self-determination, the self-advocacy piece of that, but in the, in the piece of legislation that's not included explicitly. So individual advocacy, the easiest way to explain that is one person, one problem. Somebody that is having difficulty navigating vocational rehabilitation or they need some support in carrying out a 504 plan or an IEP in an ARD meeting for school districts. Sorry, I know I'm throwing out a bunch of um, acronyms there. but that individual 
one person, one problem. We do have a lot of just general access to supports and services that when people come to us, it is literally working with them through that process. Systems advocacy is more about changing the longer term um, impacts, the, the bigger things that you can't just you can't just eyeball at one time and say, oh yeah, I went out and did this today and this is a systems advocacy. It just, that's not what that is. That is more of a, you know, I'm showing up and give public comment. I'm working on helping um, communities with their uh, Title II ADA transition plans or things along that nature. Locally, when um, one of the first efforts that we tackled at BDCL was trying to make our transportation system here a little more um, more accessible for people and giving them options. So systems is a really big and you don't see the, the immediate change for that. In 2014, um, with, when the Rehab Act was reauthorized through WIOA, the fifth core service was added. So reminder, these are core services and we are all responsible for doing them at every Center for Independent Living. And that transition included a three-legged stool of sorts. So we have young adult transition, which according to the way that the it is defined is no one younger than 14 and not older than 24. The person has already exited from high school, so not somebody who's in an 18 plus program or someone who is receiving um, any type of services related to being in school. They have to have exited either by graduation or they've dropped out or they've, um, however it is that they got out of there and that they were eligible for special education while they were in high school. The thing to think about in this is, is that somebody can be eligible for something and it doesn't necessarily mean that they received it. So, I mean, I, that's a, a finer nuance term and this is how we have to report things federally, but just sort of so you know um, what that scope is for young adult transition. And then we get to institutional relocation and institutional diversion. Across the country, institutional relocation for most places and most centers for independent living, the first thing that will pop into someone's head is nursing home relocation. And that's very important and it's become even more important um, with COVID that we, you know, try to not facilitate people living in congregate settings um, or in nursing homes if the person chooses to want to move out of that particular situation. Texas is kind of unique in that um, nursing home relocation has been something that, that has been funded out of Health and Human Services um, Commission here and is done through contracts at the state level. So different entities across the state are contracted with HHSC or with their managed care organizations to provide those nursing home relocation services. So everybody is um, all, so all 254 counties are covered. BBCIL was founded in 2010. So prior to that time and Centers for Independent Living involved in nursing home relocation, that was already established through um, the contractual arrangement with other entities. So the Austin Resource Center for Independent Living and the Crockett Resource Center for Independent Living sort of share our, you know, share our combined area in that. And then, um, so for us and I'm sure for other centers across the, the country, that institutional relocation has to broaden out to more than just nursing homes. And I think it was intended to in the intent of the law when it was um, added in there. So when we think about institutions, we're also thinking about 
hospitals. We're thinking about jails and prisons and um, mental health hospitals, state supported living centers and that that sort of a thing and helping people that are in there relocate to get them out of there. And then the third leg of that is institutional diversion. And that's basically any service that we need to put into place to keep somebody from getting into that institutional setting to begin with. So those are the core services. Um, and then now we're going to talk about what a, what does a center actually do? You want to go ahead and advance that, Mackenzie? Thank you. Now, this is my best commercial voice I have for you. But wait, there's more. Um, and this is not exclusive, but I felt that it was pretty relevant, particularly for our agribility, um, just because of some of the things that you guys are particularly interested in um, on a general basis. So centers can provide assistive technology, personal, personal assistance services, preventative services, transportation services, and then other and other is any service required to promote the full inclusion and participation of individuals with disabilities in community living. So um, while that is definitely not an exhaustive list in the law itself, when you read down all the services that a center can do, the very bottom one is literally other and it has to do with what is needed in our um, what's needed in our community. So I'm going to, and I apologize, I didn't drop this link over in the chat already, but I have one I'm going to plop over there now. And Mackenzie, is there any way you can link to this one so we can show it? Do you want to pull that up, Corey? Please. Okay. This is just an example of what other looks like from a community based perspective. This is the Texas um, Texas Reds Fest, which is here locally, and it is a steak and grape festival. And several years ago, um, we decided, you know, look, we were having a problem locally in people that used wheelchairs um, or other assistive devices being able to partake in this um, event that's very important to our, I mean, it's a, a festival for our community. And if we think about Centers for Independent Living and their ability to promote access to all things in community life, this was an area that we felt, you know, look, this is serving and it keeps attracting more and more people every year. I think at the time we got involved in it, they were, they were, they had about 10,000 people um, coming through this festival each year. And part of this too was thinking about people who are driving their own vehicles. So they are they have a vehicle that's modified and they use a power chair. And this is a steak and wine festival. Um, and they also have beer and all kinds of it's very alcohol based thing so if you think about this in terms of somebody who drives themselves and as a person who drives myself somewhere if i'm going to go out and drink i'm going to have a designated driver well who is the designated driver for someone who has a who drives with a modified vehicle and this was part of our just in general, we want, we want to make sure that this is accessible for everybody. So we went over to the, um, went over to the event planners and we said, look, here's a laundry list of everything that we could possibly think of that would make this festival fully accessible. And they said, awesome. We, we just, you know, we welcome that. And they did. what we you know what we started with and then where we ended it up my point for directing you here is to we can scroll down to the bottom of that mckenzie and keep going so there's a little button down there a word that says accessibility 
And we'll just click on that. That takes you over to the Accessibility Help Desk Services. So this is a part of what we uh, have been able to incorporate into this particular festival. And we do this in other places too. But when we look at, you know, somebody having the ability to be mobile through it or to have transportation back and forth to it, we do things like making sure that all of the, you know, we know where the accessible restrooms are and we're able to convey that. We have three maps for people that want to, who prefer a tactile representation of where all of the events, um, activities are taking place. We have um, wheelchairs, walkers, scooters, things like that for people to check out. We have interpreting available for the uh, various concerts and things of that nature. If someone needs to go out and or wants, you know, some wants to check somebody in or out to help them to be able to access the dining establishments or the shopping. Um, and go down there just a little bit more. Oh, the power, the power share charging station. That is something that, I mean, that's just a thing, you know, if you're going to be out with something and your battery is going low, uh, having that wheelchair charging station is important. And then the same thing with the um, service animal relief area. So we really do try to make sure that as much of that stuff as possible. I mean, we are offering it and people come up and ask for it, but it also totally integrates accessibility and universal design in the beginning of the, in the beginning of this instead of the end. Now this refinement with us and, and Texas Reds has happened over the years, but when the pandemic um, came to be, and then once we started receiving vaccines locally are uh, it, in Bryan, Brazos County, we had the Brazos County Vaccine Hub. And, you know, we talked about, started out as a, can we borrow a few wheelchairs? And the next thing you know, we are um, smack dab in the middle of that. And that's where we needed to be. You need to be responsive as a center for independent living. and. We were there from the minute that they opened until the minute that those part of the, the planning and the, the carry out and the follow through for that from early late January to June the 3rd. So, okay, that accessibility help desk is just a, an example of what promoting access in the community looks like. Not every community needs this. Um, our community did, and we've just been lucky enough to, to be integrated. So if you can flip back over to the main presentation. So who does a SIL, who does a SIL serve? Centers for Independent Living serve anybody of any age with any kind of a disability. So it's incredibly broad. It's also designed to not be complicated. So you know, somebody can come in and we say, do you have a disability? And they say yes. And we say, OK, what is it causing you um, difficulty with in terms of um, how can we how can we serve you? And it really is just kind of that simple self disclosure of the disability, not a lot of paperwork. There are certain programs that each center, you know, I gave you the five core services, but when you have all of those other services, some of those programs that are unique to that center do require more, ex more extensive um, documentation and services than what than what the core services do. But those core services are des are designed to um, make that very very available to the population. So we can hit the next slide. So a couple of things. First of all, um, there are centers for independent living in every single state and about 400 plus or minus across the country. They in Texas and 
this in the presentation, the that top one links over to the Training and Technical Assistance Center for Centers for Independent Living and gives you all the contact information for all of the all of the centers across the country. And you can definitely tell that each one um, is different and unique. In Texas, we have 27 centers for independent living covering all 254 counties. So with the 254 counties being served, part of that service area falls into the independent living services that is more purchased services under a contract with um, the Health and Human Services Commission. As far as centers for independent living that, so let me back up for a minute. Out of the 27, BV Cell here in the Bryan College Station area is the youngest of those 27 centers. We were funded in 2010 and opened our doors to the public in early January of 2011. So here, at that time, we covered um, five counties, Brazos, Burleson, Madison, Robertson, and Washington counties were our core service delivery counties. And then when the legislature, the legislative, the legislators took this, the independent living services program that had been part of the Department of Assistive and Rehabilitative Services and moved that under health and human services at the state level. And then they contracted out with individual centers for independent living to provide services that were across the, that were across the state in all of the counties. Prior to that, every single county was not served. Every single county was not served. Um, now they are for at least the purchase services part and then have based on federal priorities and state priorities determined which centers and what level of funding level, what funding levels need to be administered in order to bring up every center um, to meet the same to meet the same standards. So within the past two years, we added Grimes County to our service delivery area. And you can't just arbitrarily go and add a county. This is a, um, a process that needs to go through. And one of, those, one of those things is going through the state plan for independent living. I wanna talk about the state plan for independent living We've got these 27 centers in this state and every single state has a, a state independent living council. That council is appointed by the governor and has a staff at least and it's all it, it's different in every state. In Texas, our governor appoints our board. Um, I'm sorry, our state independent living council. And that independent living council is charged with developing a state plan for independent living, looking at what are the priorities for the state, what are the, the priorities for counties, what, what about you know certain targeted groups, thinking about what are underserved and overserved populations, all of that information is contained in that state plan for independent living. The State Independent Living Council does not oversee centers for independent living. They are designed to work together. So as a center for independent living, we work with our State Independent Living Council in activities involving that state plan for independent living. And that's the same for the, the rest of us here in Texas. Um, and then at some point in the, the links, there is a, a link over to the state plan for independent living. So you can check that out if you wanna see, you know, what kinds of things are covered in there. 
for those of you that are located in, in other parts of the, the state. And then I think probably the most important part of all of this is to think about if you visited a Center for Independent Living is that each one is community based and not residential. But if you've seen one Center for Independent Living, you've only seen one because we really do look differently. Um, a couple of the larger ones, in, there's one in Arizona that's called Ability360. I have no idea what their um, staffing is or their funding levels, but it is a really big mass organization that um, has broadened the scope of what centers can, you know, what level of services centers can provide. And then Independence First in Milwaukee is also another big one. In Texas, um, like I said, we, we are the youngest one. So I definitely don't put us out there as the, you know, this is the model example. There are centers in Houston and Austin and Dallas that, that have been in existence um, way longer than ours. I think one thing that's challenging for the public is that we don't all have the name Center for Independent Living in our titles. So going back and looking at, you know, what is that link and how do I find the one that's there? If you're in the Dallas area, those are called REACH, R-E-A-C-H. Some of these, um, some Centers for Independent Living, particularly the ones that were funded um, early on and established early on, those centers, tended to have acronyms that did not reflect um, current people first terminology and that type of thing. But being able to go back and look at what, you know, what is the, where can I find a Center for Independent Living, even if I'm looking at it and I don't know the name for it. And then if we can just take a minute here and plop over to the BB Cell website, And this is just to show you, and we try really hard um, as people that serve individuals with disabilities to be sure that we're also, that's what we're entirely based off of. So our website was designed um, by a gentleman who is a JAWS user, so he is um, blind and did our programming and still does lots of troubleshooting for us along the way. Um, but this just directs you over to our site and has um, all the verbiage of what is a Center for Independent Living, um, you know, what kinds of things are we required to do. Normally, the first thing that somebody gets when they come to here, come to this website is a pop up that says request service. So if you're referring somebody to us, to us, it's got the ability to say, okay, I'm referring this person and why. That became very important for us and our connections with um, Voc Rehab here because, you know, Vocational Rehab would tell somebody, you know, we'd really like for you to go over to BB Cell and, you know, become part of their support group or, you know, go over there for independent living skills and learn how to ride the public bus system. But Sometimes people get so many referrals, they don't know exactly why, why they're here when they show up. I'm here because my school referred me or because um, Voc Rehab referred me. The ability for those referral folks to go in and also give us sort of a heads up, this person's coming and this is what they're, what they're looking for. Or for people that are just, um, they just prefer to do things through the web instead of doing them live and in, you know, live and in person. They've got the ability to do that through there. And let's see what else. I think one of the first things I said is we're all independent, private, nonprofit organizations. So that is one of the things we have to have funding that exceeds our, um, just our, our federal grant. So we, we have fundraising events we do resource development activities. We participate in a lot of fee-for-service um, activities to, to help 
build other services that we provide. Dining in the Dark is probably our most um, signature event here. That is um, you know, our goal when we set that up was to be able to have an educational experience for employers so employers could recognize the capabilities that someone has and the limitations that an environment places. So sometimes to be able to see a problem or an opportunity is the perspective that you look at this with. So our um, when we have that event, it is in a completely blacked out except for one candle watt that the <laughs> fire department requires us to have, but can't really see that anyway. But it's completely blacked out. We have the menu as a mystery. You don't know what the menu is ahead of time. Um, beforehand, there's entertainment and the Disability Student Services at A&M has the assistive technology room over there where they've got a lot of um, educational aspects for people to to think about um, what it what using different types of, of equipment and, and things might be. And then when you go into, you know, you're you're seated are um, the people who do the serving are all people who are blind or have significant disabilities. You are also as a participant in addition to having a mystery menu and being in a blackened out room. Um, we also provide blindfolds and, and things like that so you can make sure that it's um, truly that kind of experience. And uh, I don't know what else to say about that. Somebody else may have something that you've been to that's similar. Uh, we This is one thing that people just absolutely love and we, we appreciate being able to do it. We also appreciate our employers who are the ones that typically purchase tables to that event, showing up and being able to see, you know, if we just change and alter the environment a little bit, how does that change and alter the person's um, ability to perform? So truly showing how much environment is an impact and it's not necessarily that something is wrong with the person. Anyway, I think that's really, unless, is there something else on that slide deck that we need to get to? Or was that it? Oh, looky there. Questions, do you have anything at all for me? And um, if you look, you can either post your questions in the chat. Um, I, sh I think I gave all of you guys the opportunity to unmute yourself if you would also like to verbally ask any questions. So. If you have any questions, feel free to drop those in the chat or you can unmute yourself. So I'll start with a question. Um, what are some examples of some of the classes or trainings and things that you do there at BB Sill? Oh my goodness. Okay, well, we have a basic sign language class, which is really popular for folks. A lot of our classes have changed because of the um, because of the pandemic. So prior to. I feel like that's going to be what the rest of everybody's life. We're going to have a pre COVID and, and a since COVID. So prior to COVID, we had a lot of travel training, teaching people to ride the public public bus system teaching people to ride the A&M bus system, explaining um, what Uber and Lyft are and how they work, taxi cabs, um, a lot of assistive technology. We have a, a pretty expansive uh, assistive technology lab that is uh, provided to us through the University of Texas at Austin and have the, the capability of, you know, working with somebody if they are wanting to try out different devices, we've got an individual at this point that we're working with um, doing some speech to text and text to speech kind of kind of systems. 
Uh, let's see, what else did we do? Money management was a really big one. We had a health and fitness program that was initially funded by the Texas Council for Developmental Disabilities. When we work with an, with an entity um, to start something, then we generally, you know, we go into it with the mindset of, all right, we know this is limited funding, but how can we integrate that into what we do? And we didn't have any idea when we started that health and fitness program, just how integrated um, it was going to be, because a lot of people truly, in order to be able to, to maintain stamina to participate in the community, required those health and fitness classes. That's also a really good example of how things have changed as a result of COVID. Now, when you, you look at things that are available, those supports and services and activities I mean, do you really need a gym anymore to be able to go to a gym? Um, I mean, what can you, what service did you used to have to pay for that now you don't? You can just, you know, get online and, and do it that way. In center activities right now, we are, uh, we have a lot of different uh, projects at A&M that we are affiliated with. So we do, one of the classes that we offer is written driver's preparation, which is super important for people. You know, you might have someone who has an intellectual or developmental disability that is offered written driver's prep um, classes that they just can't, they just need more time than what that little two or six week program is. For some, um, it might be a three year process in order to get in order to get through that. Every activity and class that we have here is all based on what the community asks us for or individual. We refer to folks as consumers. That's the language that's in the, the Rehab Act. So the people with disabilities who have set their own goals and decided what services that they want in support of that. It just that changes um, month to month and we put those calendars out and, and have those changes. But, you know, we've done laundry skills classes. We've got a full teaching kitchen, um, you name it. It's probably been there. We've had a Braille class time or two. Awesome, thanks Jackie. And then um, say that I know someone that I feel like um, needs services from a SIL, what is the best way to refer someone that maybe I know or encounter in my um, work environment that might need those services? Sure. So I would say that if you are not in our service delivery area, um, which includes, um, we did add Grimes County, I forgot to list that earlier. If you're not in our service delivery area, you should go to the link for the directory, which is um, through our Training and Technical Assistance Center. And I can't remember which slide, which slide that was back to, but that will give you the direct contact information for every center. Of course, you're always welcome to come to BBCL's website and fill out that request to service. And as Centers for Independent Living, we all know one another in the state. So I know, you know, who covers um, who covers Lee County and who covers in the San Angelo area and Amarillo and Lubbock and each of those places. And we're happy to connect you with that. And you can do it through the request of service or you can email or call. But um, any of those ways are ways to be able to refer somebody. And then you just need to talk about with the person that you're actually making the referral with, ideally you're communicating with them or having them encouraging them to make the outreach um, and, and make that connection with the center. And every center is just gonna look different beyond those core services. Awesome. Thank you, Jackie. Did anyone else have any other questions? Uh, this is Ellie. I have a question, Jackie. 
So when is our when when do you anticipate when we can do the dining in the dark? <laughs> oh, I am. That's a loaded question, right? Um, I am really, really. We a couple of years ago, um, our board decided that we would offer dining in the dark every other year opposite the legislative session. Okay. And, you know, that sounds kind of strange to most people. Why would you do that? We had dining in the dark in the spring here. And as an entity that does a lot with advocacy, we really need to be involved in the legislative process from an educational perspective. So dining in the dark takes so much time and training and um, coordination to be able to pull off and tons of, I think on the day of the event, well, the time leading up to it, we need about 150 volunteers to pull that off. So having it opposite the legislative session is the best way to do it. Now, last year, 2020, which that was our, um, you know, that was the first time that we moved it to be scheduled to the fall. And then, you know, COVID came in and wrecked everybody's life. Mm -hmm. And 2021 was not going to be a year for dining in the dark anyway. So our hope is truly fall of 2022. 22. We will be back with that, be back with that event. Thank you so much for that, Jackie. Yeah. I look forward to that. Well, we always appreciate your help, <laughs> too. And that is the one thing I will say. Um, we just have such great volunteers. And I don't know if it was there were maybe one of those slides or maybe it's just something that McKinsey and I talked about at a different point was ways that you can get involved with the Center for Independent Living um, or with and or with the state plan for independent living. If you're interested in serving on the State Independent Living Council or the Rehabilitation Council um, for Texas, you can apply for those positions and then the governor appoints, appoints those. If you want to get involved with your local Center for Independent Living, like we have a board of directors. Our board of directors is required to be at least 51% people who have significant disabilities. and we've just been so fortunate and rely on that board heavily because everybody offers their own you know they bring their own personal experiences to the table so that kind of um, opportunity is available the opportunity to teach a class if you have a special skill or a talent that you want to share um, we had an individual several years ago um, that really loved gardening and the person used a, a scooter and needed a needed raised raised wheelchair accessible beds and wanted to have a gardening class and even though we've got a big cement back thing out here in the you know we it's basically just a driveway but we were able to put that out there and he was incredibly successful in growing tomatoes and mints and herbs and those things were taken and used in our healthy cooking classes and you know your center for independent living needs your help they need advocacy they need guidance they need um you know they they really your doesn't matter what you think you may or may not be able to contribute i'm sure you've got some special knowledge or skill that would be useful and appreciated Thanks for that, Jackie. Yeah, I was wondering, too, for individuals um, that are just willing to help, how they might be able to do that. And I've been to Dining in the Dark as well, and it's a great event. Um, is that something that uh, other centers for independent living do as fundraising events and things like that? A lot of the centers do do fundraising um, activities, They in which is sort of a an interesting concept with a federally funded with the source of the funds being federal, but because our the part of what we have to do as centers for independent living for our accountability with the administration and community living is resource development. So when we're looking at dining in the dark, we're looking for resource development. And I know in 
every center, that resource development really does look differently. Um, some it could just be a an annual activity um, or semi-annual activity that they do, and then others focus more on grants and contracts and um, things of that sort. In Texas, we're the only ones doing um, dining in the dark. I don't know if anybody, any other centers across the country have um, have picked that up or not. I know we've had at least four different centers in Texas that have come to our event um, and seen the behind the scenes things and things like that with the, the goal of wanting to do that back at their place, but then by the time they've seen all the binds, they're like, oh, that's way too much work. Nope. And it really, it is a lot of work, but it's also, that's a strong area for people that we serve here. You know, we've, and, and a lot of that's because of, of the university and the different programs that are affiliated with that. But as far as I know, nobody else is doing dining in the dark in Texas. So if you want to do that, you're going to have to come here. Thanks, Jackie. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Just wanted to thank you, Jackie, for all the times that you guys have hosted uh, when former Texas uh, vocational rehab, when you did the many trainings there. That was really good also. Awesome. Thank you. And it's such a good thing for, I mean, for other people to see. I mean, we're in a strip mall over here with a whole bunch of other businesses and you know, what does the business community think when they when they see somebody with a um, with an obvious disability? You know, what do they think? And one of the you know, one of the things that is so wonderful about being in this very public display is everybody being able to see what people are capable of. And it's just, and that's one of the things that many training absolutely did. We've got, you know, the, the public sees a whole bunch of people who have visual impairments out in our back parking lot learning how to use power tools. You know, you got saws going where, you know, every which way. And it really does a lot to destroy some, ne some negative stereotypes when they're able to see all of the abilities that um, come out of here. That's awesome. Um, I just want to remind you, we do have a survey, just a quick survey. It's just a few questions. It should take you just a couple minutes to fill out. I link that in the chat um, just to let us know kind of how we're doing, how the webinar was, if you learned anything. Um, and then there's also opportunity for comments if you have any follow-up comments or topics that you feel like would be helpful to add for future webinars. Um, we will all, we've also recorded this webinar and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, once the recording is done, you normally give us about a week to get that edited and put up, uh, but that will be available if you um, would like. I will um, stay on for a few minutes and drop the link to our YouTube channel in the chat. Um, I know we're getting close to uh, one o'clock, so I wanted to let you guys go on time. If possible, it will stick around if you'll have any other questions. Um, and just thank you, Jackie, so much for presenting with us today. Well, thank you all for having me. I truly appreciate it. Appreciate all your support. And, McKenzie and we'll be and Jackie, around I, if you have questions. I also added Jackie's email as well as ours and just a little information on it in, in case they want to reach us. Thank you, Ellie. In the chat.
All right. Well, it doesn't look like anyone else has any questions. I did post a link um, in the chat to our YouTube channel if you're interested. We do have some other recorded webinars and videos there about some of our programs. Um, and again, if you ever have any questions about any of our programs, we've um, included our contact information as well. But thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Have a good day.